Welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Julie Sonneman. I'm the fellow at the Gratian Institute, um, an independent policy think tank based in Australia. Um, thanks for joining tonight um, on this really important topic. We're discussing the impact of COVID um, and the shift to remote schooling and its impact on students, especially the most vulnerable students. The schools are now reopening in many parts of the world. And while we're not yet out of the woods, it's timely to be talking about how students went during remote learning what we should do next, as well as what are some of the lessons that we can learn from our response efforts that this big shock that we've just seen into our system um, has brought us. So we've got a really exciting panel here tonight of top researchers from Australia, the US and, and the UK. One of the benefits that's come out of this situation is that we all actually all have our eyes on the same issue at the same time. And so there's a lot that we can share across the ocean. So I'd like to, Welcome our three panellists. Um, first, we have Darlene Opfer, the Vice President and Director of RAND Education and Labor. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, RAND is a prestigious American non-for-profit global policy think tank that prides itself on fact-based analysis and has offices in over 50 countries around the world. Um, we also have Tony McKay, the President and CEO of the National Center on Education and the Economy based in Washington, DC a not-for-profit organisation which looks at what we can learn from high-performing educa education systems around the world. And we also have Rob Coe, um, the Director of Research from the Education Endowment Foundation in the UK, an independent charity that was established to review evidence on what works in schools and teachers. And I'm sure many of you out there, many of you out there will be familiar with the, um, the toolkit that the EEF um, promote and that Evidence for Learning in Australia also promote. So we have an outstanding panel tonight. Thanks all for making the time to join. Um, the plan is to have a bit of a free flowing discussion. We'll have panel discussion for the first 30 minutes and then we'll move to 20 minutes of Q&A. So there's a Q&A box. Please feel free to submit your questions as we go and please let us know who you are when you do that so that we can give a bit of a, a shout out. Um, I'm going to kick off the discussion now with a few words on our report that was released yesterday. Um, and then we'll jump into a few questions with panelists. So really, I want to start with highlighting three things. Um, the first thing that we found through our work at Grattan is that, um, look, despite the best efforts of schools and teachers during remote learning, um, it is likely that the equity gap between advantaged and disadvantaged students will have widened. Um, when you look at the teacher surveys that are coming back in Australia and when you also look at the literature on the impacts of school closures, it's more than likely that most students have learnt a bit less, but it's disadvantaged students who will have lost the most. And this includes students from low-income families, from rural and remote areas, Indigenous communities, um, especially students with special learning needs, and um, as well as, as students who, who have poor mental health who may have um, found the period of social isolation to have exacerbated their existing issues. Um, so we know that there is a gap. Um, our the second thing is that our estimates show that the, the, gas, the gap has widened by about 7% over this period, which if you look at a period of, of sort of two months of um, remote schooling, that translates to about one month lost. So, one month is a, is a concern, um, but what you also need to do is to keep it in the broader context of the much bigger ex existing equity gap, um, which is roughly about 10 to 20 times greater than the gap that's opened up over COVID. So really what we're seeing here is that the losses from COVID compound an existing equity problem that's, that's pretty hard to ignore. And the third thing that I'd just like to say before we start is that we have identified a number of solutions in our report that we believe can be implemented quickly to help disadvantaged students catch up and potentially make some inroads into that existing poverty gap. So we're recommend, one of our big recommendations is that governments invest in small group tuition programs, which are shown to work and have large impacts within a short period of time. These things are expensive, but given that there is a lot of government money going out the door at the moment in terms of stimulating the economy, we believe that there can be some win-wins. Um, and it's a really great opportunity actually to trial an initiative that often schools might find too expensive to do um, on their own. And if we can learn from this and see what might help 
to inform how to tackle the bit much bigger existing equity gap, then, um, then there's actually a lot that we can achieve. So I might now move to um, our panel discussion just to unpack some of it, these ideas and others. So um, firstly, Darlene, I might, um, I'd like to direct the first question to you. So in terms of um, the work that RAND has been doing in the US and through your American educator panels and some of the feedback from teachers in those, what have you been seeing about the experience of teachers and students on the ground in remote learning? And have you seen many differences for students from low socioeconomic households? <clears throat> Thank you, Julie. Um, so at RAND, um, we have standing longitudinal panels, as you suggested. And uh, in April, we were able to get surveys out to teachers and school principals uh, to a nationally representative uh, sample. And, and what we found is uh, somewhat depressing and disturbing. Um, even uh, teachers in upper income schools report that they're covering um, a very small percentage of the curricula. So when we ask teachers, you know, are you covering the kinds of topics you normally would, only 12% of the total sample said that they were. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a significant loss of uh, topics being covered. Um, also though, I think students who are, uh, low income students are affected, as you mentioned, even greater. So one of the questions we asked is that during the time that schools were closed, uh, were you in contact with all or most of your students? Um, teachers that, are, that serve low-income kids, only 9% of them had contact with all or most of their students during the closure, um, compared to 25% of other teachers, which is not great even for other teachers, but it's particularly disturbing for low-income students. Yeah, right, okay. Um, that's been... Fantastic that you've been able to get some of that data at such a large scale. Um, great. Um, Rob, I might now shift to you to, to, um, to talk about what you found in terms of the rapid literature review that's been conducted to, um, to look at, you know, what are, from past events, what do we know about the likely learning losses that happen during school closures? Okay, yeah, thanks, Julie. Um, so, uh, as you said, uh, Education Endowment Foundation is a charity uh, based in England that's dedicated to remove, uh, uh, eliminating the attainment gap between um, disadvantaged and other pupils. And it's an organization that's very much driven by evidence. So, when this discussion started to happen and people are talking about various evidence about school closures and the likely impact of school closures, uh, it felt like this is a pretty diverse field with lots of conflicting claims and, and you know, where does the truth lie? So we set about trying to do a, a systematic review. We haven't called it a systematic review because it isn't, um, we weren't able to do a full systematic process, but we had a transparent search process and inclusion exclusion. And uh, we published that in our protocol. You were part of the team that helped to do that. It was pretty intensive. Uh, but it was it was really quick, you know, just a couple of weeks really of, of intensive work. So we found um, we'd set out to look at uh, all possible causes of school closures to see what the impacts were, including epidemics and hurricanes and snow and all sorts of other things. Um, our focus was really on the impact on the gap, so not just the impact of closure on learning in general, but what difference does it make to the gap? And that really limited the amount of evidence that we could use. Uh, maybe that's a good thing, but it meant that we ended up with only studies that looked at um, vacation, summer vacation, uh, and quite a small number of studies too. But from those studies, we suggested the best estimate is about 2% of a standard deviation a month. In other words, um, uh, the gap in England, uh, age 11, is about 40% between disadvantaged and other pupils. Uh, so that uh, over six months, which again, that relates to the context in England where most schools will be closed for most pupils for probably about six months. Um, that translates to around about a third of the, uh, an increase of the gap of about a third. But it's not a great parallel for all sorts of reasons. Summer vacation closure is not like what schools have been doing, uh, you know, the, the stats that Darlene's just given, for example, show that this is not normal summer holiday. Um, and the range is quite wide. The number of studies wasn't huge. Um, 
So uh, there's a lot of caveats, I think, around that research and how it applies. But, you know, it's consistent with what you've said, that basically the evidence suggests the gap will widen. So right. uh, we should do something about it. 30 percent, a, a, a widening of the gap by 30 percent is a really alarming figure. Have you had that response from people that you've um, spoken yeah. with? Yeah. I think it does. It draws attention uh, to the to the, um, the the you know the likely impact. Um, I, I think there's a lot of um, uncertainty around that estimate. So you know it could be a lot more. It could be a lot less. Right. And what are some of the factors in the literature about why that gap opens up? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think the short answer is we don't really know as much about this as it'd be lovely if we did. Uh, that's probably an answer to almost any question about education, if you're really um, um, high standards of evidence about it. Um, so I don't think it's that well understood, but I do think that basically uh, the way I would think about this is that education is, is like a, a kind of distortion of an equilibrium that will return if you don't keep working at it. So the various forces in, in children's lives and in their communities and and so on that, that lead to that gap in the first place, you know, it's like a, a kind of forest growing back. If you don't keep cutting it away, it'll it'll grow back. And school is an intervention that that actually does keep the forest away and um, pushes the water uphill, if you like. And as soon as school is not uh, in place, then the water flows downhill or the forest grows back. And um, so I think it's um, all these interventions need to be sustained and they need to be high quality and they need to be targeted if our agenda is about eliminating or even just uh, minimising the gap. Very true. It reinforces the reason why we send children to school during regular times. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Right. OK, um, so now I might touch on uh, moving to, so thinking about as schools reopen, what are some of the things that can be done to help disadvantaged students catch up? So Darlene, um, you know, I've just spoken to what we found um, in our report, but we know that you've also been doing a lot of work. Where, where's your thinking at in the US? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that there are two things that we've looked at. And one of them, I think that all uh, both the EEF, you and RAND have all looked at, which is um, individual tutoring or small group um, tutoring, which shows um, a very significant payoff at, at as you said, um, quite an expense. But I think we're in a, a situation where right now where that expense may be worth it. Um, we've also, because of the economy, if think about we've got a, a, a whole cadre of new college graduates who most of them or a lot of them will be without jobs. And so um, one of the discussions that we've been having here in the US is possibly creating a tutoring core, um, kind of like our Peace Corps or other service kind of core where we're in a moment right now where we have people who need jobs, they're educated, they could get in there and help us really close the gap. Um, I think the other thing that we have looked at are uh, summer learning or extended learning programs. Now, typically, um, those don't do a very good job, but they can. And it's all about how they're implemented. And so uh, we did a really large random control trial um, over the past uh, five years or so and found that uh, they work when they have sufficient numbers of uh, hours spent on core academic content taught by teachers who would normally teach them. So say you have a student who's in third grade, their summer teacher is a third grade or fourth grade teacher. So it, summer programs work when they look more like the typical school year. The, the programs that don't work or the after school programs that don't work are when um, they're less academically focused. Right. And I guess now that you'd be entering into the summer break soon in the US, mm -hmm. that's a great time to be running camps like that. They, they are. But what we've been advising is if you don't are if you didn't already have plans for summer, don't rush into it. They need to be really well planned out. It takes a lot of effort to make sure that they're good and high quality. Start planning for next summer. Don't just rush in this summer and, and try to get something in place in weeks. Hmm. How, how does it work with social distancing and, um, and summer camps? It's, that's a, it's an ongoing question actually yeah. right now. I think, yeah. um, you know, certainly limiting numbers. Uh, so as we're talking about for school reopening that 
we might have to be going in shifts or uh, odd and even days, something like that to keep the numbers down. Very interesting. Um, now, Tony, um, I might touch um, a bit on your recent report that was released yesterday um, that looks at you know uh, what high performing systems are doing and and what you know what are some of the initiatives that they've been thinking about to help help students catch up once schools have reopened yeah well i think they might have been listening to darlene <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, i'll pick up on a couple of the same issues um the report is a report that scans the way in which the highest performing learning systems as you say approach distant le distance learning, both at the point where uh, they were exiting uh, scheduled classrooms and uh, school opening, and the way in which they've re-entered. Yep, so uh, that report's available now and we'll make sure that the link uh, is sent around. But um, I think in order to appreciate the way in which they've re-entered, you have to understand what they were doing uh, during the uh, height of the uh, the coronavirus crisis within the respective jurisdictions. By the way, these jurisdictions are the ones that we know against the current metrics drawn from PISA are uh, the most uh, effective, efficient and equitable. So let's be clear about the subset of jurisdictions that we're referring to, yeah? And it's pretty clear that um, they already had in place some pretty serious plans. Uh, and if I think about Finland, Estonia, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Ontario, China, yeah, have a look at the fact that uh, they had already established platforms uh, with resources, uh, obviously against already clearly articulated national curriculum. So you're in a position where in fact it was possible for them to move into that space uh, and, and pivot toward distance learning uh, rapidly. It's clear also that they had invested in teacher training. So therefore, access to resources and familiarity with those tools is a feature of those places. Um, obviously, they needed to have tech available for students. Um, and uh, in, in the vast majority of cases, for the ma vast majority of the population, they did. And they also were pretty keen to look after priority groups that they believed would be more vulnerable or at risk, yep. And by the way, they anticipated the need to be in contact with parents. Now, if all of those things are applying, your point of re-entry, right, is of a different order. And yet, here's the interesting thing, which I think matches some of the things that uh, Darlene is saying and, and Rob's been picking up on. Uh, if you take Singapore, their re-entry for, um, a couple of weeks between the semester breaks was pretty well focused upon um, assessment, right? Where are you up to? In other words, let's not just immediately re-enter here. Let's have a look to see what the situation has been in terms of your learning during this period of time. Um, like uh, the summer break, most of it was spent on monitoring progress over the period. Estonia brought back smaller groups of people, often young people who had actually been more at risk upon that group in order to make sure that uh, they felt that they were prioritising uh, those who had been uh, in the most difficult circumstances or struggling. This is still relative, yeah? Uh, and if you take uh, a place like Ontario, they've done exactly what uh, Darlene's talked about, namely they have been planning for uh, summer opportunities, yeah? So, and if I add even in the case of say of Singapore, um, they've been thinking very carefully about how they keep schools open during the break, not only for young people to come in in order to be, be certain that they are able to catch up if, they, if they've uh, slipped back to some extent, but also to have facilities and infrastructure available for young people across sport, physical education, the arts, so I, I think that the reconnection in a number of the highest performing countries needs to be cast against the exit, <laughs> what was happening during that period of time. And then, then, but it's still interesting to me that they have prioritized some of the things we've talked about rather than just assuming that you can actually kickstart 
immediately. They've been very sensitive, including, I might say, four or five of them, including Hong Kong and other places that have thought very seriously, and Singapore, about the nature of assessment, national assessment, and to what extent do they need to actually adjust that. So, thoughtful. Really thoughtful. And I think it's fascinating, I think, as you say, even though they may have had uh, what it sounds like some really high quality remote learning going on, they still invested a lot in assessment to see where everybody was at. So yeah, not taking anything for granted. Darlene, did you have a, um, a, a comment? Yeah, I did. Um, it's interesting that Singapore um, focused so much on assessment. It's a, it's a debate right now here in the US. So there are some who think that, um, you know, immediately everyone should do some kind of assessment, whether it's the one that they normally would have done in the spring that they didn't do or uh, other existing assessments. And I think the conversation is turning against those um, large scale assessments because Absolutely. they won't yeah. they won't be fine grained enough to help determine what should be taught. So the conversation is really shifting towards um, what kind of formative assessment or ongoing kinds of assessment can be put in place to drive learning rather than just take sort of the temperature of how big is the problem. Yeah, and I should have made clear, Darlene, exactly your point, uh, Julie, that it was, it's much more of the formative diagnostic variety that we've been experiencing in these places. And in fact, their reaction to assessment has been, how do we actually reduce the burden of external assessments, right, uh, when in fact uh, learning has been to some extent in these places obviously interrupted, not as much as in other places, but I'm with Darlene entirely about the nature of the uh, assessment approaches they've been taking. It's been in the service of learning, yeah. Uh, can I make a comment there, Julie, as well? Yes, on, definitely, on the, great. I mean, I think it's really interesting we're having very much the same debates in England. Um, and I, I disagree slightly. I think there is a place for the, the sort of high level assessment, or can be in some cases. Um, but it, for me, the crucial thing is that before you embark on any kind of assessment, you're clear what you're going to do with it. So um, uh, the kind of exception I would make, I think there are, there are standardised tests available, for example, of reading, where because reading is such a key unlocker of the whole curriculum, that um, there might be a case for a school, say, using an assessment like that, which is quite high level. It's not granular. It's not um, doesn't get down to the level of, of kind of diagnostic uh, elements of the curriculum. But it could tell you something useful if you are clear what you're going to do with the results. So if we find here's a group of students who are behind the rest or behind where they should be, then these are the kinds of things we're going to do. So it's about the purpose and matching it to an action that you've intended rather than is it high level or is it is it granular? I think it's a really good point, Rob. Um, mm. And I think we've been having, yeah, that debate in Australia as well about NAPLAN was cancelled this year. Um, and I think to some degree that relieved schools and teachers of what they saw was a burden and to some degree is a burden. But I think there is a real downside there in terms of the system not necessarily having access to that information at scale about what's the variation and potentially what, um, which schools are, you know, um, need more assistance than others. Um, while we're talking about assessment, Rob, I might, that might actually just be a good time to talk about a question I was going to ask later, but just in terms of the formative assessment, what, how, do you, um, how do you see teachers' skills in that area um, at, you know, at this point in time, and do you think that that's something that teachers will need extra help with? Yeah, it's a, I, I think over all of this, um, and you made this point earlier as well, Julie, um, that in some ways this highlights a whole lot of existing issues, doesn't it? You know, we already have a big disadvantage gap in attainment. That's not news. Um, but maybe politically there's there's more energy to do something about it. Um, same issue, I think, with assessment that, you know, um, uh, the sensible use of assessment uh, and, and good response to high quality assessment is a key part of effective teaching and effective school leadership. And that's always been the case. And you know, there's good evidence to support that. Um, and there are definitely gaps. I, you know, I, I don't think there's systematic knowledge about how, how much do teachers know about assessment, but anecdotally, and this is an area that I've been involved in working with teachers and training teachers for, for many years. Um, uh, yes, that there's, a, there's a lot of room for improvement, I think, in terms of teachers' knowledge about assessment. And this is maybe highlighting it because of some of these debates about, well, how will we know 
um, how big the gap is and who's fallen behind and which bits of knowledge are missing and um, all of that. Those are basically assessment questions, I think. Yeah, definitely. And I, it's a very subtle um, shift, I think, as well, because all teachers are familiar and, and used to using formative assessments. It's just the degree yeah. of accuracy and the yeah. way yeah so i mean we um uh, one of the things i've been involved with is a as an online program in training and assessment uh, through um, evidence-based education an organization i work with in in england um and teachers sign up to do this and one of the commonest things they say is that i didn't you know when they get into the course is that i didn't realize how much i didn't know about assessment because you do it every day you think okay yeah i know you know i know what i need to know and then we start asking them these hard questions about, um, you know, well, why are you doing this? And, it, you know, is this really good quality? And uh, can you, because can this kind of information inform this kind of judgment and so on? And, the, and, and their whole world in a way unwinds um, because they realize that there's quite a lot more to it than, than was evident before. Definitely. Um, I might jump back now, Rob, um, and ask you the, a question around what the EEF is proposing in the UK, um, which, yeah. I understand is also around small group tuition um, and look given with our a lot of our work in Australia is based off your evidence-based um, summaries it's it's no surprise that we're on a similar solution um, can I ask what are you how are you how's the EEF thinking about how that could be rolled out and what are some of the key considerations yeah I think I'm very similar to what Darlene was saying I think um, this is an approach that that definitely can work it's an expensive approach so it's a it's one that should be targeted so that again, that comes back to the issue of, of uh, assessment. I don't think this is a, a generic strategy for all children, but it is a strategy that if, if, um, if it's targeted at certain youngsters who uh, we want to particularly help, that can work. Um, I think there's, there's good evidence that when this is done well, it works like you know uh, many things. Um, and the hope is, I guess, that the difference between doing it well and, and not is, is more manageable and more tractable in this than in perhaps in some other kinds of interventions. Some of the really big impact interventions are much harder to get right, but there are some concerns about it. Tutoring and tuition um, is something that happens anyway, that you know, it's pretty widespread actually, but it's quite unequally distributed. So the proportion of children from wealthy backgrounds who have uh, outside school tutoring is, is I don't know the figures, but it, it's quite high and much higher than it is for disadvantaged youngsters. And it's also, it's a little bit of a wild west that um, more or less anyone can set up a tutoring business. There isn't quality assurance or regulation or anything like that. So I think part of the intention is that this is something we probably can scale up quite quickly because there are lots of people out there who potentially could be tutors, um, as Darlene was saying. Um, so what are the minimum requirements for making this a, a scalable and high quality venture? Well, it is about um, proper training, it's about proper quality assurance, um, and it's about evaluation uh, being built in as well. And I think a, very, a number of routes are being explored at the moment. I don't think decisions have been made about this, but the hope is that this will become something that the government's willing to fund. Excellent. And look, that question about um, the Wild West of the tutoring market is something that's very much on the um, forefront of the, uh, the policymakers' minds in Australia. Um, what are you, I mean, and thinking about for-profit companies in school education, sometimes, you know, people feel less comfortable with. Um, what, what's your view on, you know, what you've seen in the tutoring market and what, you know, should for-profit companies be part of the solution or do you think that there are valid concerns, which means they shouldn't be at the table? Um, well, I, I think that the position of the government in England is likely to be, I think, that uh, this should be decided on the basis of quality criteria rather than uh, the specific structure of, of an organisation. I think there's some merit in, you know, if it's a good organisation, then the fact that it's a for-profit um, company, uh, I don't think necessarily needs to matter. I think you need to have some checks in place. And, and the key is this quality assurance. You know, how do we make sure that they're, the people they're recruiting are qualified and have the knowledge and skills to do that job, that they're appropriately supported, that the youngsters involved to have a, a positive experience, that they actually learn the things that we want them to learn and so on. So I think uh, for me, I, I think it's more about the quality assurance and monitoring 
than it is about the um, the type of organizations. Um, very sensible response. Um, our position is very similar. <laughs> um, I might now just jump to the last part before we go to the Q&A section. Um, so in terms of what we can learn from remote schooling, obviously this is um, you know, there's been some really positive things that have come out of this, but there's also been a number of cracks that have been exposed um, in the existing system. Um, so, Darlene, what would you say about, you know, what, what have we learnt and um, what, can we better, what can we do better next time? Sure. <clears throat> um, I think one of the things that has really been exposed is the importance of high quality curricula. Um, in the U.S., there's a culture amongst uh, teachers that says, you know, uh, teachers should control the content. They should, uh, I call it, curate their own lessons. Um, the more that they do that, the harder the time they've had uh, reaching their students. The places in the U.S., whether it's, you know, groups of schools or um, organizations that had high quality curricula so that you know, every third grade teacher was teaching the same content. We're much better at making the switch to online learning than those who were not. Um, they also were able to be more cooperative because they were all teaching the same thing. I, we've seen um, groups of schools where, you know, they had one third grade teacher who's real, who really excels at mathematics, you know, design the mathematics unit that everybody else then implements or um, you know, you have the, the one uh, teacher who's really, really good at um, literacy, sort of developing a set of lessons that everybody else implements. And so it's not a single teacher having to burden, have the burden of, of coming up with lessons for every single subject that they should be, see, be teaching. So I think, you know, this notion of like having um, a high quality curricula and also not seeing the teaching profession as being this sort of isolated thing, but actually a collaborative profession that works together um, is going to be really needed in this situation and going forward. Yeah, great points. Um, and a lot apply to Australia as well. Um, Tony, what are your thoughts? Well, again, if I'm coming from the, uh, the highest performing, um, then uh, effectively they've been doing what Darlene is recommending or uh, where uh, we've seen more success. I mean, clearly um, the best prepared actually had their act together in terms of portals and platforms and resources. And, and we're talking about uh, not, not a, a district level or a, even a state level that you might uh, aim for in the US context. Uh, or certainly in Australia, but um, we're talking about national. Now, if we're talking about national, then in fact, in the Australian context, we do have that, but we, want, we might want to explore that later about to what extent that was leveraged. But um, I take the point entirely about a curriculum framework. Uh, where you've actually got a curriculum framework and you have got clear learning goals, then you can, you can uh, organise your learning around it. Um, so that's exactly what these high-performing systems do and that's what they did and they certainly I, I said before about the training of teachers around digital tools which actually have got quality standards attached to them so um, they're in a strong position by the way they also have a fair bit of public confidence uh, a number of these jurisdictions uh, have been working in ways where the connection to the public and parents is one that's already been established and so the move to more digital online wasn't a surprise to parents where in fact you'd already been doing a lot of that work in a more blended and hybrid way. And particularly where you've got an entire society that's actually comfortable with an e-environment like in Estonia, then uh, this is hardly something that is going to cause them concern. It's how they live their lives. I do think the difference, going back to the point that we had before around uh, using tutors and where you get the expertise from, just to be clear about a couple of these places, they are really strong on peer to peer which is Darlene's point about collaboration, and they're very strong on expertise and specialists. So you could rattle through uh, tutor teachers in Finland, um, ed technologists in Estonia, um, teacher TV presenters in China, right? Uh, immediately on the national platform, the best of the teachers presenting classes that simply are then shared, right? And if, and if you take, say, I don't know, South Korea, advice hotline, 
Yep, anybody can get in there with advice from those people who really know about um, pedagogies in an online environment. The, the point I'd make is that even given all of that, the big lesson I think we should learn from the high performing systems is that they are thinking about post COVID-19 and they are thinking about not disruption, but reimagining. And this has been an accelerant on multiple fronts. So uh, we are seeing in all of these jurisdictions, what kind of pedagogy really is most powerful in online environments? Can we rethink the curriculum and assessment priorities that we have? For goodness sake, we've been talking about, you know, general capabilities in this country and competencies for years. It's been rhetoric in many places. Some of these places are stronger and they're saying we need to do better. They are saying we need to recognise learning out of school. Uh, surprise, surprise, when it actually comes to recognition, particularly as you go through the years of schooling and you think about new forms of credentialing. And they're actually saying, listen, we've always argued about the importance of social and emotional learning. Well, let's be clear about the importance of that for cognitive development uh, as well. And what about a bit of a focus on self-regulation uh, that really does help learners? Uh, in the environments that we're talking about, increasingly uh, hybrid and blended. So I think there's strengths already in the current system that are being displayed in these jurisdictions. But I think what we should be taking notice of is the way in which they're thinking about the future of learning that uh, can take some serious acceleration out of a disruption into a reimagining, to use the kind of language that people have been using. Yeah, really interesting. And that's that's a that's a nice upbeat angle, Tony. Um, and I think, yeah, it's gonna be fascinating to see the more, you know, the more about the more we learn about what has come out of this period, I think will be really yep. interesting once it's been reviewed. Um, and look, that actually ties really in really nicely with um, Rob, did you have any other comments to add on that point there before we jump to the QA? Um, just very quickly, I mean, I definitely um, echo the comments about curriculum. I think it's it's really important. Um, you know, remote learning is still learning. And so the same principles that apply in learning about the quality of the interactions between teachers and learners, the quality of the instruction, but also the, the feedback and the, you know, the motivation, everything. And so um, I, th I think it's really important that we try, we don't think, oh, this is a, a completely different kind of activity. It's the same kind of activity. It's just in a very different context and obviously more difficult, but the same principles about what's effective in pedagogy I think still apply yeah right yeah no um, very true um, now I might jump to one question here um, there's a bunch of questions in our q a inbox which is fantastic um, let me just see so we've got one here from Mary Clark um, in Melbourne Victoria so um, you know what have been the positives for vulnerable students? Um, has the crisis raised awareness and momentum to addressing inequities? Have steps been taken, oh, it's just jumped, um, particularly to bridge the digital divide? And what pedagogies have we seen that might help disadvantaged students with some of the digital pedagogies in particular? So Tony, you talked a little bit about some of the digital yep. um, pedagogies and what we're learn learning there. Does anyone have any comments on anything around uh, digital pedagogies for disadvantaged students in particular? I mean, the, the, the big issue is access, I think, that uh, um, for, for many youngsters, um, just having access to online learning is very problematic. And so that's a problem that I, I'm not sure what the solutions are. It's not just about hardware. Um, there's a whole range of different issues there that I, seem quite hard to solve. I'm not sure that I've seen good solutions to that. I want to go to Darlene's point, though, I think, uh, around the curriculum. Um, unless we've got a strong curriculum framework, uh, which allows uh, teachers to move into that space using digital tools and young people to use digital tools um, that uh, avoid the superficial learning that I think we have seen in many cases, um, unless we can actually ensure that we've got those curriculum frameworks in place um, and we've got uh, learners and teachers working together and teachers, by the way, who have got, I, I take uh, Rob's point entirely, I've got pedagogical content knowledge uh, that applies 
both in terms of face-to-face -face and online, right, and have got deep pedagogical knowledge uh, and content knowledge separately, then we are going to be exposed. I, th I think the point that, is it Mary that asked that question? Um, yes. The, the question, I th the issue for me is we, we just had a big summit, an annual summit with ministers of education and teacher union leaders, the International Summit on the Teaching Profession that is now in its 10th year. Uh, 20 of these leading of OECD countries, right? And the highest performing of those. And all of them were arguing the case that they had 15 to 20% of young people uh, that they targeted as being at risk, vulnerable, disadvantaged. In Australia, we know exactly the same statistic that they were quoting. It's more like 30 to 40%, which is exactly the point that people have been raising. This has made visible the extent of inequity that we have in all systems, including high performing systems. So that is absolutely, I think, the, the issue that's emerged out of this crisis, that a lot of that was either hidden or we hadn't been prepared to seriously confront it. Now I get the, the strong sense is that jurisdictions are serious about confronting it. I agree. I completely agree, Tony. And I think you've now got a situation where I think in the general community, because parents have also gotten that insight into education up front, just there's a there's a really good degree of compassion right now to act on this issue. Yep. So it's a great time for governments to be active. Yep. Um, I might jump to an interesting question from Sandra Milligan, who I um, presume is a Sandra Milligan from University of Melbourne, um, uh, about uh, it's, her question is, so I wonder if when we see the opening of the gap and differences in measures of success, we are focusing on things we typically measure, like mastery of content coverage. In the long run, these things may not matter as much as we think. What about the other things that might have been learned, like having a different life experience? Um, and, and what can, uh, uh, um, learning how to learn by themselves, you know, which I think look goes to one of the um, you know something that's been discussed a lot about um, the you know the non cognitive skills and the broader life um, skills that you can learn from being at home. And I completely agree that they're sorry. This, I'll I'll, have, I'll throw my two cents here and then open it up. Um, that I think you know there is so much in this um, basket that we need to know much more about and how to measure much more effectively. Um, and we're still learning in that space. I would say when it comes to the equity gap though, that actually it's likely that you're still going to see the gap in those skills as well, if not more. And um, so completely agree, we shouldn't be talking about this as a narrow academic lens, but um, unfortunately I don't think the inequities disappear if we take that broader lens. But yeah, Darlene. Yeah, um, I think this goes to the point um, that that Tony and Rob have made about the relationship between um, pedagogy and mode in the sense that um, so if you think about the online environment, it's not very conducive to knowledge transmission. I mean, it is if you're like doing a video or whatever, but but the the thing that it's most useful at is connection, collaboration um problem solving and so i think you know when we think about going forward and how we um, organize instruction that if we want to deal with those other kinds of skills like learning how to learn and that we think about what the platform allows for for that skill and then develop um, activities that are that are appropriate for the platform and that outcome um, and i don't think i think as Tony mentioned, other countries are further along in thinking about that, um, certainly further along than the US is. Uh, it's just now starting to be a conversation when we talk about going back to school with social distancing. You know, if the, if the kids are all in the classroom six feet apart, all facing forward towards the teacher, what can really be taught under those conditions versus others? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can I send a point to, to Sandra's um key issue here. By the way, Sandra and I are working on a, a new national program called Learning Creates Australia and the, the uh, major project about that really is learning pathways for young people, particularly the intersection between or interface between the senior years of secondary education and then obviously further higher education in the world of work. I mean, let's be clear, um, prior to COVID-19 there are plenty of young people who are disengaged 
And by the way, they continue to be disengaged, right? They didn't show up for online learning in the same way as they hadn't been showing up uh, for class-based learning. Or if they'd been in classes, they weren't showing up anyway because they were so disengaged from it that uh, we have plenty of stats about the nature of young people and their levels of engagement. The point that I think Sandra's making is that we've got to use this opportunity to redefine success for young people. And surely it is time, again, as Sandra would be arguing, that we're thinking very differently about assessment, around credentials and around metrics. Metrics around what surely needs to be thought about again in terms of what is success uh, in learning and in, in young people's lives. So I have to say, I, again, Julie, I'm delighted that the, the crisis has brought this into sharp relief. It's not as if we didn't have plenty of indicators of it before, but it's been brought into sharp relief. Agreed, agreed. Um, completely agree. Rob, did you have any? Yeah, any um, I, think, I think it's a really interesting question. And, I, you know, there's no, it, it basically uh, the whole purpose of education comes under scrutiny, doesn't it? And what, why are we doing this whole thing? Uh, and it's right that we should debate that. I, I think that's right. I think it's also important to keep a distinction between the things we value and the roads to, to achieve those things. So I'm sure we'd all agree that uh, the broader aspects of learning, the, the character building, the uh, life skills, the learning to learn, the higher order uh, skills of, of creativity and, and collaboration and all those other things. Those are all important. Nobody's going to say that's not important. I think where there is a debate, though, is how you achieve those things. How do you, how do you achieve that engagement? Um, and um, I, I think we should be cautious of going down a route which says, well, let's uh, try and make things more interesting or more accessible because in the past those have often not succeeded. They, they end up with a kind of dumbing down and um, actually disempowering youngsters who are disengaged and, and otherwise already disadvantaged. That's not, I don't think, an argument for saying, you know, let's just kind of teach some boring facts and hope that they uh, keep up with it. But I, I think um, it's, it's a balanced approach in my mind. But I think the, the route to engagement is through a high quality curriculum, actually. And it, a high quality curriculum for everyone is ultimately the most empowering thing. So we, we, you know, if we believe that, that this is what we want for, for, for my children, let's say, then that should be on offer to all children. It's not, I don't think the systems where you say, well, this group are gonna learn this and this group are gonna learn that. Uh, those tend to that kind of segregation uh, tends to end badly I think is what we learn yeah look these are these are difficult these are really big questions here um, and Australia's just got a major review underway about senior secondary school pathways and the assessments that we're using in year 12 so all these topics are really really um, front of mind at the moment um, look I, I mean I I agree to partly with Rob around, I've been struck by the need for much more evidence and clarity in that space still, which I think is a argument to say we need to be investing much more in, in learning about how to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, so one point I think is really important is that if we think these things matter, we should find ways of capturing them. You should, we should try to yes. measure what matters rather than emphasize what we can easily measure. And I, I think there is a case to be made for saying, well, that's, that has become a bit distorted. But I don't think I would go as far as say that um, mastery of content doesn't matter. I think it does matter. I think it matters a lot. Yeah. Uh, but it's not the only thing that matters. And, and if there are other things, we should try and find ways of capturing them too. And Julie, by the way, as we do this work, it might be quite a broad idea that we actually talk to young people. Uh, they do have a thought or two about the way in which they think learning might become more powerful, more relevant, more meaningful, right? And might actually be learning that matches their own aspirations uh, for uh, a life of learning. So we give a lot of lip service to things like social and emotional learning, and we talk about learners being at the centre. Uh, this might be the moment in which we say, let's get serious about this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, and talking to students is a crazy idea, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Um, 
Uh, I might just bring out a question here from Lawrence Sayer, the Director of Digital Learning from Halebury. I think, yeah, Tony, um, do these high performing systems focus strongly on general capabilities? Do they? Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you actually have a look at um, the curriculum in Singapore, if you have a look at the new curriculum in Finland, if you have a look at the curriculum that's obviously been part of the, the first and second round of major reforms in Hong Kong, you have a good look at what's going on in Ontario uh, and in British Columbia. All of those places have been serious about what we would call general capabilities in the context of Australia. Um, so the question is, to what extent has the seriousness translated into uh, a curriculum framework with uh, adequate time, right, and ways of being able to attack that attack that, those competencies embedded in disciplines and in cross-discipline work? And to what extent are we serious about the assessment of that? And what assessments are we using? To what extent are we gonna to continue to have debates about the validity and reliability of this? How do we capture it in forms of recognition of learning? I mean, they are struggling with all of those conversations, but they're struggling with it. If you take Australia, there we were 10 years ago, talking about this as part of the Australian curriculum, right? We do have general capabilities, uh, and we've just been announced announcing that we're gonna do a review over this period of um, 21 into uh, 22. And we're serious about obviously decluttering the curriculum, getting greater alignment, better coherence, and making sure that we are serious about the general capabilities and pedagogies that will support them. Now, we didn't then go on and say, at least I didn't see it in the ministerial statement, that we're gonna be serious about the assessment of these things as well. But that's gotta be part of the conversation in this country. I could add a bunch of other countries that I think have been making great uh, progress in this area, including, by the way, places like Poland, pl places like New Zealand, you could go on. There's a lot of activity taking place. We were one of the first countries to get into this game, right? In, for, in terms of a national curriculum, really privileging this work and thinking seriously about it and actually getting into the territory of thinking about not just the descriptions of them, about the conceptualization of that work and then thinking about learning continua. So I'm really pleased to see that in the review here, uh, we are going to, to make um, a serious effort uh, to commit and invest our time and energy and effort into it. But it's gonna to have to be curriculum, pedagogy and assessment. All together, yeah. Yep. The golden triangle, yeah. It has to be coherent. Like yep. everything has to align. And I think that's one of the things that really separates those high performing systems. They're, they're aligned and they're very clear about their outcomes. Those two things together. Yep. For sure. I might, um, I might read out here one comment that sort of struck me, which I, th um, I think is something that perhaps Quite a few people um, might be asking, and I've now just lost track of it. Um, it was from Susan Cridge, and it, the crux of the question was, what about um, you know, uh, what about investing in in teacher skills for targeted teaching or differentiated teaching rather than just jumping straight to tuition? And I think this is something that we definitely considered at Grattan, and we have um, been a big advocate for supporting teachers to upskill in targeted teaching. The um, the thing that's really been on our mind is that's a long-term investment. That's something, and that is, I think, absolutely right. Um, uh, one of the learnings that I've personally had in look, sitting down and looking at the research is that, you know, there is a trade-off here between what is able to be implement, implemented, where, where is the evidence strong around, we know that we can implement this at scale, where there's been positive results, and, and when you, and when you look, at, look at the research with that lens, you know, things like small group tuition actually do come out a lot stronger. And I do think there's been a tendency to potentially expect teachers to be do, to do everything in the classroom. And I think this is a great opportunity to actually trial um, ways that might reduce that burden, but open to others for comments. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, go ahead, Rob. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I feel quite torn about this because I think on the one hand, uh, as I've said already, and others have, you know, this is no different. We've already got 
um, challenges within the education system and you know we we want children to learn we want the gaps to close and the things that worked well for that uh, before we had the school closures and the uh, covid crisis are still the thing so they are about high quality teaching they're about uh, good systems for professional learning um, they're about targeting making sure the best teachers are in front of the children who need them most uh, you know, all of those things are really important, but you're absolutely right. Those are, um, they're slower to have impact and they're harder to scale. So I think one of the things we mustn't do is take our eye off that ball, which is the, the wider systemic, uh, gradually lifting the quality of everything we do and the quality of the education system as a whole by building that um, human capital, if you like, the quality of teaching that's happening in classrooms every day but uh, there is a case, I think, for doing this more targeted, more scalable, uh, yes, more expensive, but uh, probably easier to realise immediate benefits from things like tuition. Darling? Uh, yeah. Oh, apologies. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say that, you know, differentiation is really hard for teachers. So we have been, because I've been a strong advocate in the U.S. Of, on, for high quality curricula, uh, we've been looking at places that have high quality curricula and where it still doesn't seem to be improving student outcomes to the extent we think that it should. Um, so Louisiana, we work with a lot. Uh, they've had a high quality curricula in place for uh, about six years now, but they weren't seeing those kind of gains. And when we got in there and started looking, what was happening is that teachers who needed to differentiate the curricula, almost every time they did, they lowered the cognitive demand. So they just weren't good at being able to figure out how to get across the same information or the same skill um without sort of dumbing it down and and so i think it sort of goes to the point where to, that rob and you were trying to make that you know maybe we shouldn't ask every teacher to be able to do that maybe we should have the sort of teachers who do that well give the targeted kind of uh uh intervention and then you know not require that of every single teacher because it's a very heavy lift to be able to do that you know, I just add a couple of points here, Julie, because I think uh, well, Sutridge actually knows this stuff well <laughs> because of the networks of schools that uh, she is uh, leading. And she knows deeply the power of uh, professional collaboration uh, and team-based approaches. So on the one hand, here we are, fascinating moment in time where uh, you can have one to many on, on <laughs> online <laughs> uh, in the way that uh, we've described some of these high-performing systems using that. And yet we know what the effect sizes are when you get one-on-one -on -one and one to small groups and the power of tutoring. And surely we must be coming to a point where we understand that the future of the profession cannot continue to be based upon the way in which we currently allocate teachers to classes. I mean, this has got to be another moment where we say we've been arguing about a more differentiated teaching profession. We've been arguing about the importance of allied professionals. We've been preaching the gospel, not just of having deep knowledge and obviously autonomy, professional autonomy, but about deep professional collaborative work, team based. We're actually surely we must be getting into the territory where we understand the only way in which you can meet the needs of all young people that are so much differentiated is to actually have teams. I mean, we do it in other sectors. Now, I know that's got big implications for funding, but Sue and others know that this can be done and networks of schools are investing in precisely those approaches. So I hope that this crisis will actually help us not only to think about the curriculum and the pedagogy and the assessment, it actually helps us to think about the future of the teaching profession. Just to get a little bit passionate. Yeah, that's fantastic, Tony. Very articulately put. <laughs> Rob, did you have a comment there? I could see you. Well, yeah, differentiation. I mean, we've touched on a few issues uh, during this hour, <laughs> but we could easily have spent a whole week of, of webinar on any one of those. So assessment, I think, is one. Um, differentiation is definitely another. Um, this is so widely misunderstood and so hard to do, actually, because I, th I think what, what Darlene said is absolutely right, that um, on the face of it, when you're a teacher in front of a group of youngsters, they're, they're, what they already know and their capacity to learn is variable, however they're grouped. 
And so the way you have to uh, interact with them has to be to some extent individualized and differentiated. But when you actually talk to teachers about well, what does that mean, then you end up with a whole lot of things, a mixture of some things that are very effective and high quality and some things that are really not. And um, uh, differentiation is one of those words that is just so misunderstood and so abused actually. And uh, I think we've had a history in England fairly recently of this being a requirement that inspectors wanted to see a, a kind of particular visible form of differentiation where teachers would actually plan almost three lessons within a lesson if you like uh, with different learning expectations and, and I think there are some real downsides to some of that. Um, I would say uh, in summary I think to get this working really well you've got to somehow uh, persuade people to believe things that are just impossible you know the idea that every child can succeed we know it, it can't be true and yet you've got to believe it somehow and one of the implications of that is that you do you and the the youngsters themselves have to work a lot harder and spend more time and more investment and need more support to achieve that same level of success so if you give the same support to everyone you end up just preserving that that range uh, and the, the, where this works well is in systems and again I think this is a feature of, of most of those high performing jurisdictions that Tony's been talking about that they have a very different mindset about well you know it's not okay just to preserve this this wide range of performance it's our job to compress it and to bring the, all learners up to a level of success that we think is um, acceptable. It's a really nice way of thinking about it Rob um, and I think I think um, uh, I might wrap up here. I think, you know, I think this disruption to schooling has really amplified a lot of these, you know, existing debates that we normally have. It's amplified, um, I think, a lot of the inequities that, you know, we've seen in terms of the gap widening um, and it's amplified our passion for, you know, putting on the agenda um, things that, have been there for some time and do need change. Um, so I wanted to thank you. We've touched on some really sophisticated ideas, pedagogy, curriculum assessment, we've covered the full gamut. Um, so thank you so much, Darlene, Tony and Rob for your time. It's been an absolute privilege and you've brought so much wealth of knowledge to the table.